Hello friends, this is Yaakov Wolby and I'm on my brother Rabbi Ari Wolby's account and it's uh, given it's the last day of the year I thought maybe we could share with you a nice idea from the Parsha that we just read yesterday an idea perhaps that would make our 2018 maybe a little bit more dynamic and powerful and wonderful so last week's Parsha of Ayichi begins where Jacob is about to die and he tells his son Joseph I want you to bury me in Israel the Egyptians that really wanted to bury him in Egypt and instead, he says he wants to be buried in Israel next to his father and his grandfather in the cave of the patriarchs. So Jacob, at the end of the parsha, he dies. And after a lengthy mourning process, uh, Joseph goes to Pharaoh and tells him that he wants to be, his father wants to be buried in Israel. And in the beginning of the parsha, Joseph was sworn. His father made him swear, swear you're going to bury me in Israel. So at the end of the parsha, Jacob dies. Joseph goes to his his to Pharaoh to the king and asks him, Can I, "My father made me swear to go bury him in Israel. Can I do it?" And Pharaoh responds some really interesting, interesting verbiage. He says, "Go bury your father in Israel as he made you swear." So Rashi kind of grabs onto that point. What does it mean that Pharaoh said to him, "Go bury him in Israel"? as he made you swear. So Rashi tells us something really surprising. Pharaoh tells Joseph, made, bury him in Israel because, and only because, he made you swear, he made you pledge that you're going to bury him in Israel. Had he not forced you to swear, I wouldn't have allowed it. And Rashi explains, why is Pharaoh being, uh, playing hardball with Joseph and saying, I'm only going to allow him to, I'm only going to allow you to bury your father in Israel because he made you swear that you're going to do that. And Rashi tells us there's an interesting backstory here. In Egypt, the rule was that the king had to be, the pharaoh had to be well versed in all the known languages. He had to speak all the languages. And when Joseph was being vetted to be viceroy, they said, well, he, he, if, he wants, if he's going to be king in Egypt, he has to know how to speak all the languages. So they started inspecting him, and they're going through language by language, and he knows his beans. And then they get to the end, and Joseph says, well, you forgot one language, Hebrew. That was a language that was only part of the Jewish family, of Abraham's family, only they knew Hebrew. So it turns out that Joseph knew one language more than Pharaoh did, which rendered Pharaoh ineligible to be king. Joseph really was the true king. And therefore, there was a little bit of a crisis because Pharaoh had a problem. Joseph had some damning information about him. And all the way at the beginning of this whole story, Joseph was made to swear. Pharaoh made Joseph swear that he's not going to reveal this information. He's not going to tell the public that Pharaoh is not legitimately the king because he doesn't know Hebrew. And therefore, says Rashi, when Jacob made Joseph swear that he's going to be buried, he's going to bury him in, in Israel, Pharaoh said to him, okay, he made you swear. I also made you swear. And if I tell you to transgress your oath to your father, well, obviously, it only lends itself that you're going to transgress your oath to me. And therefore, because he made you swear, and I don't want you to start transgressing oaths, I'm going to let you bury him in Israel. One of the commentaries, the stipler Gon, he asked an interesting question. Is Joseph really going to go over to Pharaoh and say to him, hey, listen, you made me transgress the oath to my father. I'm going to transgress the oath to you. It seems kind of problematic. You don't speak like that to a king. The king is, he's the king. And you don't say, oh, if you force me to transgress this oath, I'm going to transgress. It's not the way you talk to a king. So what is this, what is this backstory that Rashi is telling us? Oh, had Joseph been forced to renege on his oath to his father, he would renege on the other oath. Joseph is not going to operate like that. So the stipe Gon, the commentator on the Torah, he gives us a fantastic insight. I think it's a crucial insight uh, that will help our lives and improve our lives in whatever's left of 2017 
and beyond in 2018. He says like this, Of course, Pharaoh was not worried, he wasn't concerned, that immediately after he transgressed the oath to his father, suppose Pharaoh said, I don't let you bury your dad in Israel, you've got to bury him here. Had that happened, Pharaoh was not worried that Joseph is right away going to run to the tabloids and run to the press and spill the beans that Pharaoh doesn't speak Hebrew. That's not, that's not what his concern was. Pharaoh was concerned that Joseph is a man of integrity. He's a man of truth. He's, after all, the son of Jacob. Jacob is, is the paragon of truth. But the way things actually operate is that people who have a very high sensitivity towards a given behavior characteristic, and they are compelled, they're forced into a corner, and they have to transgress it, that just naturally is going to cause their sensitivity to diminish. And whereas previously, Joseph would never renege on the oath, because oaths are very serious. But Pharaoh recognized that once he gives in, even once, right now it's not as sacrosanct that you can't transgress an oath, and therefore there may come a time, because his commitment to preservation and upholding his oath has been tested and has been questioned and has been diminished, there's going to come a time that circumstances will have it that now with his lessened severity towards renege on an oath, he's going to renege on the other oath that he made to Pharaoh. I think the Talmud tells us, it's an interesting statement in the Talmud, uh, that uh, Rabbi Huna, Rav Huna says, once a person sins once and then sins twice, it's permitted. If you do the same sin twice, it's permitted. Says the Talmud, is it really permitted? How could it be permitted? Says the Talmud, no, it doesn't mean it's actually permitted. It means that it's as if it's permitted. Because in his eyes, it used to be all sins. Oh gosh, I can't do this sin. But you do it once, and you know what? The world doesn't end. And you do it twice. And you start to develop, uh, it becomes normal. It becomes the new normal. And thus, you could get into the slippery slope where things that would, people would never consider to do now become second nature. And I think this goes really both ways. There is the negative side of it, which is the case of Joseph or the case of the Talmud. But there's also the positive side. Things that are, let's say, very difficult. And you cannot imagine someone being able to have the, the, the fortitude and, the, and the, the wherewithal to be able to do something so grand. I can't possibly keep Shabbos. It's so difficult to turn off my phone and to, and to unplug and to be totally enveloped by God for 24 hours. I can't do it. Right? That's what you think. But you do it once. And this sensitivity, so to speak, this, this unconquerable mountain, the way it was previously, you realize it's not so hard. You do it twice. And just like on the negative side, once you do something a few times, it becomes more easy and more available, and you're more apt to repeat. On the positive side, the same is true. You do it once, and it's, you think like, oh, gosh, I can't possibly do this. You do it a second time, and wow, this becomes very easy. So the hope is, you know, we're about to start a new year. And of course, it's not the Jewish New Year. It's the non-Jewish New Year. But I think it's, good enough, it's, 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 it's an opportunity for us to, to just take any time, any inspiration that we could possibly get. Why not? And it's an opportunity for us to say, okay, let's try to think of what are the spiritual tasks that we feel like, oh, that's beyond us, and say, okay, let's give it a shot. You know, it's a new year, there's new opportunities, and why not? What do you have to lose? Try it, do it once, do it twice, and it will become easy, it will become a habit. And because it's new year, new year's resolutions, may I advise going to torchweb.org, our website, and seeing a smorgasbord, a cornucopia of amazing educational opportunities as Jews. We want to beef up our connection uh, in the new year with Torah and with the Jewish nation and with our history. And may I just put a plug, uh, uh, just uh, give a shout out 
on Tuesday night, the beginning this Tuesday night, uh, at the Torch Center at 7 o'clock. We're going to begin a fantastic series, five books in five weeks, be, uh, taught by my brother, my esteemed brother, Rabbi Arya Wolby. And be, before that, we're going to also have a five millennia in five weeks. So if you want to know the, all of Jewish history, a broad cross-section of Jewish history, we're going to have back-to-back -back five books in five weeks, five millennia in five weeks, I look forward to seeing you there in the new year. Let's make this a new year, a New Year's resolution to commit ourselves to study some Torah and to embrace the heritage of our nation. And I thank you all. Happy New Year.